Hello, welcome to our presentation on the Orbital Hyper-Responsive Deployable Anti-Satellite Munitions Network, the ODAM mission. I am Jose, and with me today we have Matthew, Joseph, Nicholas, Tejas, Sudarsana, Narayan, Randall, and Ellison. First, we will be taking a look at the overview of the ODAM mission. In the current world we live in, technology plays an important role for countries to function. Countries are more susceptible to cyber attacks, and that becomes more of a tactic to win wars. Thus, the United States needs to be able to interrupt a satellite's communication to Earth or have the possibility to destroy a satellite in the case of escalating conflict. The motivation for our project stems from this idea as a way to de-escalate conflict in times of war with other nations. The main idea is the use of an entity satellite system, or ASAT for short, that would block enemy satellite communications. By being able to apply this temporary pressure, the United States has a bigger chance of de-escalating conflicts before more harm is done. This has to be done without creating space debris, as a single creation event can be cataclysmic and increase the chance of destroying satellites vital to our nation. Next, we will be taking a look at our mission statement. Since satellites are so important for communication, navigation, and reconnaissance, the primary purpose of our mission is to be able to temporarily neutralize a combatant satellite without increasing the risk of space debris. As any nation losing any of those services would put them at a disadvantage and would cause them to most likely disengage from any war. The ODAM mission can be split into three major objectives. The first objective is successful neutralization of any combatant satellite, which consists of disabling two-way communication and neutralization of multiple satellites simultaneously, either permanently or temporarily. The second objective is to have a fast response time between the ASATs and their target, as we would like to intercept communications. The third objective is having the ability to extend the lifetime of the ASATs through station keeping, as we plan to set up a constellation of ASATs at various orbits. Thus, by being able to temporarily or permanently disrupt the service without destruction, a deterrence is added to our arsenal without an increased risk of losing key satellite infrastructure. Mission Architectures We must balance and select the best mission architecture. There are two main decisions to make, a constellation of ASATs versus the hub model of ASATs, and physical communication blocking versus communication jamming. They each provide advantages and disadvantages for the mission. We will compare them to our three mission criteria, feasibility, complexity, and cost. ASAT Constellation vs. Hub Model We will first analyze these criteria to compare an ASAT Constellation to the Hub Model. The ASAT Constellation can carefully position ASATs at specific altitudes and inclinations that are more popular. This allows for a faster response time instead of having to travel from the Hub. ASATs are also easier to replace than Hubs. ASATs are designed to carry out a limited number of missions and then deal with themselves to be replaced by new ones. The addition of a hub adds another, more complex vehicle type to the mission. While launch costs are getting cheaper over time, having to launch multiple hubs in addition to all of the ASATs would drastically increase the number of launches, which is the driving factor for total mission cost. Physical blocking versus communication jamming. We will next analyze using a physical blocking mechanism or a jammer and compare that to our design criteria. In order to completely jam a satellite and render it temporarily useless, a jammer must interrupt both the uplink and downlink communication, and sometimes these happen on different frequencies. This would require two pointing budgets, one to continually point towards the ground station on Earth and the other towards the satellite. It is also important to note that the location of these enemy ground stations are not always known, and as the enemy satellite orbits, the ground station that it is communicating with changes as well. The amount of power required to continually jam the satellite does not fit within our power budget. On the other hand, Physically blocking the signal with the right material can be more effective and reusable for much less power. Lastly, fitting every single ASAT with the appropriate jamming technology is very expensive. Current Mission Architecture Determination Now, after weighing all of the options against our design criteria, we are able to score each of the four possible design architectures, with a score of 1 being the best and a score of 4 being the worst. It becomes clear to see that the physical blocking ASAT constellation design is the most optimal mission architecture. This is the best option because it allows for quick ASAT response time, has a simple blocking mechanism that saves on the power budget, 
requires less launches, and is inexpensive and replaceable. The hub model, with either blocking or jamming, is our alternative mission architecture. Now on to the mission characterization. The three main constraints of our mission are cost, fuel, and power. The entirety of the cost will be the sole responsibility of the U.S. government. With an exceedingly large budget, the government is able to expend a large amount of resources on this mission without worrying about running out of money. ODAM will largely be utilized as a deterrent, with minimal active operation of the ASATs taking place. Most of the ASATs will remain dormant and not use up much of their fuel over their lifespan, so will not have to be replaced often. Due to these factors, cost was not a major design driver for our mission. Fuel is one of the larger constraints. All ASATs must be online at all times and immediately be able to enter a maneuver to intercept any potential targets. Conducting orbital maneuvers like changing altitude, inclination, true anomaly, and attitude in a short response time can consume a large amount of fuel. This requires the use of stored fuel for conventional burns instead of more efficient fuel sources like electric propulsion. Carrying fuel will of course affect the mass budget, which is another major factor to consider when conducting launches. The ASATs will be powered by an onboard battery, which will need to be powerful enough to fulfill tasks related to communication and jamming. There will have to be a compromise between the mass of the battery and the time it takes to generate the required power. Solar panels will be used to charge the batteries. Similarly, there will be a compromise between the solar panel size and power. Previously constructed ASATs have used solar panels approximately 18 feet in length and can generate about 256 watts of power which would be sufficient for our purposes. One of the primary operational design requirements is the lifetime of each ASAT. We expect our ASATs to have a 15-year lifetime. We should cover the duration of any expected conflict, um, and we expect a conflict to last for about a decade or so, maybe longer, and, or it could cover several shorter conflicts. The limiting factor here is the propellant. Um, the capacity for each ASAT is to hold 350 kilograms, and while the ASAT is on a mission, it's not going to use much fuel. It's only going to use fuel when it's station keeping to maintain position with the enemy satellite. Propellant as a whole, however, is a limiting factor because once the ASAT is fueled and launched, it has no refueling capability. So once the reserves run dry, the ASAT will have to enter its deorbit procedure because we don't want to leave space debris. Um, the ground station will be notified when the ASAT's fuel reserves are, are going dry. The ASAT will enter its deorbit procedure and either burn up on re-entry to Earth or enter some kind of graveyard orbit, in which case a new ASAT will have to be launched to replace its, its position in the constellation. For our propellant, we're going to use a nitrogen and hydrazine propulsion system, which optimizes for weight and delta V requirements, and this will be covered in more detail later. Our primary design drivers are shown on this slide. The most important of these design drivers and the ones that are, are driving the system design are primarily communications, altitude, and coverage, which include the geometry and timing of the ASAT movements. Due to the extensive constellation network which we aim to create, which is going to cover all the way from LEO to GEO, altitude is a primary design driver, as well as coverage. And communication is important for a quick data transmission between the ASATs and, and Earth to minimize the time between, tra uh, between the order transmission and signal interception. And as discussed previously, fuel is also an extremely important design driver. As for the functional requirements of the ASAT, the first of which is response time. Within 2.5 orbital periods of the target satellite, the ASAT should be able to intercept and rendezvous with it and initialize blocking. The mission will be assigned to the optimal ASAT that has the lowest fuel consumption and the best trajectory, but also will reach the target satellite within the time constraints. As you can see on the right, there's a time to intercept graph at the target satellite altitude for an ASAT in low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and geosynchronous orbit. Home and transfers will be used to raise and lower apogee and decrease or increase orbital speed. The next functional requirement is propulsion. We're targeting one meter per second squared of acceleration with a fully fueled ASAP. This will keep our orbital velocity changes somewhat simple. It should be able to reignite the thruster five times, two for the first initial acceleration and deceleration of interception, two more for a possible second interception, and then one more for deorbit or pushing the ASAT into the satellite graveyard zone. The thruster should be low mass so as not to greatly impact the cost to orbit and the fuel required to move it. Should be a highly efficient thruster for similar reasons. You can keep the fuel down and keep the cost to orbit down. And then we will also have extra small thrusters for fine adjustments of tracking enemy satellites. So reaction control systems. The propellant functional requirement. So it should be able to power a medium thrust engine, which means there can be no electric propulsion and no heavy gas propellant. 
the storability of the propellant should be highly storable and there should be no boil off, which means no cryofuels can be used. And it should also have a high specific energy. So model propellants generally have low efficiency and also should not be used. The functional requirements for stability are that we have a power efficient system, which means half turns on the long and medium axis should not drain batteries by over 20%. It should be a durable system with a low probability of failure, less than 3% over five years, because a failed stability system will greatly decrease the ASAT effectiveness. And it should have the ability to rotate on three axes and translate on at least one. Three axis rotation will mean that we can move the translation axis wherever it needs to be. So we really only need two thrusters to translate two small reaction control thrusters. The functional requirements for the blocking shield, the shield will incur a hundred decibel loss. Only 20 decibels is needed for a 99% signal loss, but a hundred decibels gives us a large margin to confirm that the ASAT is completely blocking the target satellite. We need to minimize the thickness and mass, but the thickness must still be manufacturable at a high capacity. So we can build these ASATs uh, in short amounts of time and deploy many to orbit at once. And the deployment method should be relatively simple. It'll avoid twisting and tearing and have a low mass and a low probability of failure. Mission design. Another critical design component is communications. As our system needs to be available 24 seven, an extensive ground network between the United States and its allies is necessary. Out of the possible ground stations seen on the right image, four domestic and six international stations will be used spanning the entirety of the United States with locations also in Australia, Singapore, South Africa, Chile, and Norway. In order to conduct an analysis of power needed for communications, we needed to utilize a link budget which accounts for all the power gains and losses in a telecommunication system. Using the link equation shown on the slide, in addition to our assumptions from earlier, necessary gains for different power outputs can be calculated. We can then use the antenna gain equation to map dish diameter values to power outputs. In order to identify the power needed for communications, we also need a few assumptions. A data rate of 11 kilobytes per second will be used to account for both 10 kilobyte images and one kilobyte for housekeeping. In accordance with BPSK modulation, a signal to noise ratio of 9.6 will be utilized. Antenna efficiency will be approximated at 55% and we will be operating at a normal military frequency of 10 gigahertz. Moreover, we assume the maximum antenna size of one meter as many SAT antenna sizes fall within that range. With the assumptions in the communication slide, an analysis of power output needed from LEO to GEO for various dish sizes can be seen. With a constraint on our maximum dish size of one meter, it is clear that 20 decibel watts of power, which is equal to 100 watts of power, is enough for the purposes of communications. In addition to communications, as we are using a physical jamming system, we assume that one watt of power is necessary for the purposes of jamming. The ASAT batteries that we looked into for the purposes of communication and jamming ranged in power output from 45 watt hours to 1100 watt hours. As seen from the figure on the right, assuming that 101 watts of power are needed for both communications and jamming, with a 550 watt hour battery, the time needed for communications and jamming is approximately 10 minutes. This is more than enough given our response time constraints. For operational power requirements, we assume that the size of our solar panels and operational requirements would scale with the ISS. This allows us to generate 256 watts of power, which is more than enough power given that our assumption states that our operational requirements scales with the ISS. However, in case our assumptions prove incorrect, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator will also be on board. Various radioactive bases, such as polonium, which can generate 140 watts per gram, can generate more than enough power required for communication and jamming in the case that there is an emergency. Our ASAT will be propelled by an R42DM Aerojet high performance rocket engine, uh, shown on the right of the slide. It's a simple low mass engine due to its hypergolic bipropellant fuel design. Uh, because hypergolic bipropellant fuels only ignite on contact, the engine doesn't require a reigniter which means that it doesn't have the added mass of a reigniter. Um, so it can be that low, 7.3 kilograms. The thrust of the engine is a respectable 890 newtons, propelling the ASAT with about 1.4 meters per second squared of acceleration in its initial burn, and that acceleration will increase as fuel is expended.
The specific impulse is amazing when compared to similar hypergolic engines and rivals that of cryogenic fuel propelled engines. Similar engines uh, that use hypergolics struggle to break 310 seconds of specific impulse. This is 327, so that will add a massive amount of range to our ASAT and decrease the cost to orbit because it won't require as much fuel to be within its delta V margins. The propellant used in this engine is a MON3 hydrazine hypergolic mixture. MON3, that is mixed oxides of nitrogen 3, is a 3% nitric acid solution in nitrogen tetroxide, which helps counter the corrosivity of the nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer, and as a bonus, it'll decrease the freezing temperature. This propellant mixture was chosen over its counterparts in the graph on the right because it has more energy per mass uh, than its counterparts, like MON3 monomethylhydrazine or MON3 unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, meaning the engine will be able to extract more energy from the fuel and operate under higher specific impulse, like ours does. It's also denser, requiring less mass and space to store compared to unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine or monomethylhydrazine. And it's more stable at a wider range of temperatures. Generated in low earth orbit, the oxidizer may freeze uh, due to our very low minimum temperature. So we plan to run it through a radiator connected to the RTG and electronics to keep it warm. These fuels, as mentioned, don't require an igniter, which was a very big bonus for us. And it decreases the chance of failure at reignition which is a place where many other rockets fail. So onto stability, the ASAT is kept stable by a three axis control moment gyro, uh, which is three perpendicular wheels mounted to a gimbal spinning at very high speeds. Uh, so when they're rotated, the ASAT changes orientation. Uh, is more efficient and durable than reaction wheels because they don't have to speed up and slow down. They're generally at the same rotational velocity the whole time. And they also require less power, again, because they don't have to speed up and slow down. The ASATs can translate to chase targets, trying to avoid them, and make very fine maneuvers using two one kilogram Aerojet R6F reaction control thrusters, shown on the right. They're mounted at the center of mass of the ASAT, and with a 0.53 newton second bit, they can propel the ASAT with very little change in delta V, like 0.81 millimeters per second, which is extremely, extremely fine maneuvers. And a respectable specific impulse of 305 seconds ensures they won't use large amounts of fuel when making these maneuvers. Now to talk about our blocking shield, we wanted to characterize its size by, and we did that by estimating that target satellite would have five to 45 degree field of view. So we chose the minimal cross-sectional area that we could, which would give us 30 meter to 280 meter range. And we ended up shrinking it just a little bit more to fit cost and mass restraints. And we ended up getting a radius of five meters with an area of 79 meters squared. In order to fit in our launch vehicles, we needed the shield to be deployed in space. So we went with the spin deployment method. Due to its simplicity, it will minimize cost per ASAP. We'll have eight evenly spaced ribs and it will lock in place to prevent any twisting or tearing or undeploying. We went with a circular shape to maximize the blocked radius. And as you can see from the figure below, the shield will deploy at a rate of about a quarter of a meter every minute in order to, again, minimize tearing. Now to pick our materials, we needed to pick low weight the high shielding effectiveness materials, which just means that they have high reflection loss. First, we went with aluminum. And as you can see from the top right graph, aluminum has a great shielding effectiveness per thickness, which means we get high reflection loss for very minimal thicknesses, thus minimal weight. Then we went with combinal iron ball paint, which as you can see from our bottom right graph has also great reflection loss. And we chose a third option, which is the nickel iron combination. And then finally, we chose a carbon nanofiber composite due to its low weight, but high stiffness and high reflection loss, which will bring our total weight down. And as you can see from the bottom graph, it has great reflection loss. Now to talk about our shield thicknesses and mass, we had a requirement that had incurred a 20 decibel loss, which is a 99% loss of signal. But in order to be completely safe, we want 100 decibels. And we calculated how much of each thickness of each material we would need to incur a 100 decibel signal. And as you can see, the thicknesses are extremely small. So in order to make sure they're manufacturable, we chose thicknesses that were greater. And now our final design, as you can see from the left figure, our design is a five-layered sandwich where aluminum is on the outside layers to protect the blocking shield from the space environment, then iron ball paint middle layers to act as an adhesive but still contribute to the reflection loss, and then a composite layer in the middle to bring down the total weight, add some stiffness, 
and still incur reflection loss. And as you can see from our far right graph, signal loss versus frequency in the range that we're operating in, our minimum frequency or signal loss at 400 decibels is well above our requirement. We're fully confident in the ASAT's ability to neutralize a target. And after finding the thickness and mass of our blocking shield, we can characterize our total mass budget. Things to know, the majority of the mass budget comes from the blocking shield as expected, and the empty mass of the RTG is only 40 kilograms due to the fact that the polonium mass is negligible, and our total dry mass comes out to about 300 kilograms per ASAT. With the requirements of being able to intercept any satellite within LEO to GEO, the design constellation is the biggest contributor. This does has to be balanced with cost though, as we cannot have an ASAT everywhere or it would be too expensive, so the constellation is designed with our budgets in mind. We design our constellation based on how far an ASAT can traverse using our delta V budget. We use home and transfers for altitude maneuvers, as well as using the transfer orbit to change our eccentricity based on a target orbit at the alt apogee altitude. With our dry mass of 300 kilograms, we start at an altitude of 200 kilometers for LEO and see that an ASAC can traverse 1,200 kilometers with our half a kilometer per second limit. From that altitude, we repeat the process to GEO to define our orbital zone boundaries. This is seen in the table with each altitude there, and then as well as the figure with the blue being Earth and then each red ring being one of those altitude zones. We have a 1 kilometer per second budget for a max inclination maneuver but need to have ASATs in both orbits prograde and retrograde to the Earth. Calculating the max inclination that can be performed with our budget at each altitude gives us the value shown in the table there with how far an ASAT can go. With our inclination and altitude spacing, we only need 138 satellites to fully cover space, but once one ASAT would go on a mission, the system would be compromised as there's a gap in our coverage. In order to counteract this, we place double the amount of ASATs we need at each altitude spaced evenly, alternating between prograde and retrograde orbits. This also means that an ASAT will only ever have a max inclination change of what it, the budget says it is in half. Then, in each same direction orbit, alternatively, we place them 180 degrees apart so that an ASAT does not have to do a full 180 degree phase shift, but may only 90 degrees in certain instances. We then had 24 additional satellites in our 300 satellite budget that we placed in LEO because that is where most ASATs are. We, these will be placed at high interest inclinations such as 98 degrees for sun synchronous orbits. Our delta V budget is 2.5 km per second for the maximum mission that an ASAT can use, though this is, would be the worst case scenario that likely would not occur in any ASAT's lifetime. The needed maneuvers are changes in altitude, inclination, and phase as well as changing its orientation through pointing and its end-of-life procedures. As stated, the ASATs will use home and transfers to change altitude to the target, and we can see the delta V requirement on the figure here. With its half a kilometer per second delta V budget, we can see about how far a ASAT can traverse, being much farther in GEO than an ASAT in LEO. The inclination change will occur at the higher of the two altitudes of the home and transfer for a slight decrease in the fuel required. With the ASAT now in the same orbit as the target, it needs to get in the same phase, so it essentially is right on top of the target. It uses a burn to change the eccentricity of the orbit, and then counteracts it after one full orbit. The period of that phasing orbit will cause the ASAT to reach the phase of the target satellite, and it will only have to max phase of 90 degrees with the different spacings in the constellation described earlier. Then, the ASAT will use small burns to position itself directly between the Earth and the target, as well as orient itself before it deploys its communication blocking equipment. At that point, it will deploy, and communication will begin to be disrupted. A high-level operational flow diagram that characterizes the mission structure is shown as follows. The mission is split up into three parts. The first part involves assembling the constellation of ASATs. Once the ASATs are assembled, they can neutralize the enemy satellites, and as and when needed, they'll have to maintain constellation. The first stage decomposition involves breaking up the assembling constellation portion after the ASATs are launched and, and cruising to orbit into beginning their station keeping protocol, beginning their communication protocol, and awaiting deployment instructions. The second stage decomposition follows a loop pattern. Each ASAT can await and receive deployment instructions. Once the instructions come in, the ASAT will be deployed to block the signal. Once in position, it's going to maintain orbit with the enemy satellite and await instructions that determine when the mission is complete. If the instructions aren't received, it's going to continue maintaining orbit. Once the mission is complete, it's going to reposition and rejoin the constellation, and then begin to await deployment instructions again. The third stage decomposition 
involves situations where the constellation is, is disrupted. The first situation being when an ASAT is deployed on mission. The remaining ASATs in the constellation are going to have to adjust to cover the gap that has been created. Once the ASAT, ASAT completes its mission, the remaining ASATs in the constellation are going to have to accommodate for its return and adjust position again. The other situation is when an ASAT runs out of fuel. It'll have only enough fuel for, to complete its deorbit procedure, where it's either going to burn up during re-entry or enter a graveyard orbit. As the ASAT begins to deorbit, the remaining ASATs will have to cover the gap. Once the new ASAT is launched and cruises to orbit, its position will have to be accommodated. For mission computation, the ground system will perform most of it. That is because the ground system will have a catalog of all fuel and attitude status of all the ASATs in orbit. Once the user selects a target satellite for a mission, the ground system will determine the most optimum ASAT for this mission in terms of fuel status, as well as which ASAT can be deployed without leaving the system completely compromised, where there would be a gap in space where a satellite cannot be intercepted in a required amount of time. The ground system will then compute the trajectory and send the ASAT command burns in order to intercept the target. The ASAT computation would include slight pointing modifications because the ground system will not know the exact antenna on the target satellite. The thermal management for ODAM is not comprehensive because all of the targets will be in near-Earth orbits. On the table, the minimum temperature will not affect the repellent, so that is not a concern. And with our current technology of GPU and CPU, it will all be within our operating range of the maximum and minimum temperature and will not cause issues. Because of this, extra thermal measures are not necessary for this mission. Development and testing for the final ASAT design will commence in May 2022 and is expected to be completed by May 2027. During this five-year period, prototypes will be tested and the final ASAT configuration will be fabricated. All of the software and hardware will be finalized by this date and then integrated into the ASAT. Additionally, all ground stations will be fully online and integrated with ODAM. In September of 2027, the first round of 60 ASATs will be launched into low Earth orbit. From September 2027 until January 2028, these first ASATs will be monitored for correct autonomous operation. If all the ASATs maintain their planned orbits, then the second round of ASATs will be launched in January. The next rounds of ASAT launches will take place in the months following. The first ASAT resupply launch will occur in September of 2032, with a launch of ASATs taking place every year until the final launch in 2047. In terms of launch architecture, we will need a, a heavy launch vehicle to transport the ASATs, such as the Falcon 9. And ideally, we'd like to deploy about 300 ASATs in the first zero operation. And on the right is a schematic provided by SpaceX, showing the approximate dimensions of the payload region and its volume. And just going off of data given by SpaceX, we can say that the Falcon 9 collects about 22,000 kilograms of payload to low Earth orbit, 8,300 kilograms of payload to geosynchronous Earth orbit. And we'd like to do 15 launches in the very first year, which includes 7 launches at low Earth orbit, each of which can carry 30 ASATs. But five launches to MEO, which can each carry 17 ASATs, and three launches to GEO, which can each carry about 10 ASATs for a total of 300 ASATs. Um, and so our launch options are about five locations across the country. Um, the reason for this is we need to ensure that there is um, adequate uh, coverage of all the various inclinations that we need to launch at to ensure that the overall mapping of ASATs is sufficient enough to cover the entire globe. And just schedule, as mentioned previously, 15 launches required in the first year. No sort of like resupplying or no sort of uh, maintenance will be required during this period. And after that uh, five-year period, we would expect one launch per year for the next 15 years. We want to launch about five ASATs at a time. And just a general cost breakdown of, of sort of what we're expecting uh, for this overall project. Just very, very approximate. So just from SpaceX has, told, has provided data that suggests that the launch would cost about $62 million. And we want to do about 15 launches in the first year. And of course, each launch after that will will be about ten million. We're just approximating as you know, as space flight and as the technology becomes more advanced and becomes more accessible, I expect these costs to decrease substantially. Uh, I think the the biggest cost, however, would be the the initial research and development period between May twenty twenty two to May twenty twenty seven. We expect that to be significant. And that'll be that'll sort of uh, be the brunt of the of the cost here and um and exa well exactly it's because a lot of a lot of work has to be done in terms of um just getting that initial prototype right and making sure that all future iterations will, will be successful moving forward in this project. After that, the subsequent, subsequent ASATs will be about $850,000 or just approximate, um, uh, just approximate value. And we need about 374 of them for a total of 375 ASATs. We expect the, the regular just maintenance for ASATs per year to be about 5 million for about 20 years. All of that amounting to a total cost of about 1.8 billion or so. Again, all of this is very approximate um, and it's just... As a team, we have now completed ODAN's preliminary mission requirement assessment and design overview on a theoretical level. And now we can move on to creating tangible deliverables. 
Our immediate next steps involve generating CAD diagrams for the launch mechanism and all the ASATs, which will eventually lead to FEA and CFD analyses as well. Our cost and mass budget will, will update along the way, as in when we add new materials and remove unnecessary design requirements that we thought were necessary during the design process. Once the ASATs have been designed, we can map out the ASAT locations in their constellation and start calculating potential paths to target satellites and running simulations. As the design process continues, general optimizations will have to be made, and this will help us call down on our mass budget and cost budget and communication in general and create general efficiencies. We will also have to find a source of funding um, to help us move through the process. Throughout this entire design process, we've received a lot of help from Professor Smith, GSIs, G Gabriel and Max. We'd like to acknowledge them for all their support. We also received um, a lot of support from GSI Cody Scarborough from the Rad Lab for providing resources regarding radiation absorbent materials. Thank you.